If you have a true scary story you'd like to send my way, go to asthereavendreams.com and click the button to do so. Today's video is a collection of remade paranormal stories, all of these from way back in the very early parts of 2020 and late parts of 2019. Hopefully you all enjoy them, because I did, hence why I'm doing them a second time. And thank you. Here's a little backstory. From a young age, I lived with my grandparents in their house with my older brother. My garage was haunted, I guess by a man who had lived there and passed away previously. He wasn't evil or anything, he just wasn't too happy when people went into his space, the garage, and he never left his place. I never told anyone in my house that I could feel his presence, as I didn't want to be made fun of. But on New Year's Eve of 2016, we were all around our neighbor's house and my grandma brought it up. She said that it was haunted, and everyone kept saying, no, it's not. And I looked at them all and explained that it is, and that I felt his presence as well. No one believed us. Knowing about the presence in the garage, I can get on with my story. From a very young age, I was afraid of the dark. You know, just an average fear. I used to hear noises in my ear at night, and I would always feel like something was standing by my door watching me. This happened every night from when I was seven years old until I was 14. It got worse and worse as I got older, though. It started out with just a bad feeling that I could brush off, to an intense fear of something being there that didn't feel good at all. I would wake up dripping in sweat because I was so scared. I heard noises and sometimes I felt like I couldn't even breathe. One night, things went too far. It was like every other night. I woke up in the early hours of the morning, around 2.45am, and broke into a cold sweat. It was all silent for about 10 minutes, and then I heard the cutlery drawer from the kitchen downstairs being opened and fiddled with. At first, I thought it was my granddad, but he was snoring his head off in bed. Then I thought grandma must be down there, but then she coughs in her sleep and a chill goes down my spine, because it wasn't my brother either as he was at his mate's house. I was petrified and I decided to close my eyes, and then I heard someone walking up our creaking stairs. Being the 12 year old I was, I hid under my blankets, closed my eyes, and faced the wall. Whatever came up the stairs, came into my room and stood in front of my bed, breathing heavily into my ear. I held my eyes shut, and then out of nowhere my duvet was pulled off of me and flung to the end of my bed. I was completely paralyzed and my heart was pounding as I heard the heavy breathing next to my ear. After a minute or so, the thing left my room, but I was paralyzed for at least another five minutes. As soon as I regained movement, I grabbed my covers over my head and forced myself back to sleep. It has never happened again since then, but to this day, no one has ever believed me and have just blamed it all on an act of imagination or sleep paralysis. But I don't suffer with sleep paralysis at all. Okay, so my family and I moved into an old house around six or seven years ago and for over a year or two, everything was normal. However, when my little brother was born, strange things started happening around the house. I remember walking into the kitchen one day after school to get a glass of water, and I happened to look over towards the basement door. Right at the entrance leading down to the basement, I saw a black figure that was probably around four feet wide and six feet tall. I remember looking at the figure for 30 seconds, 
and then I looked away to grab my glass of water, almost forgetting what I came into the kitchen for. And then it was gone. Later in the evening, I told my stepdad about the experience that I had a few hours earlier, and he looked at me and said that he too saw the same exact figure earlier in the morning, in the same exact spot. We both still can't explain it, and it scares us even to this day. I'll have more of my experiences posted soon, but please do comment some advice for me if you have any. Let me start off by saying this. In my whole 24 years of life, I have never been on a train. Roller coasters, most definitely, but an actual train, no way. From the time I was little, when my grandma and mom would take me to Six Flags St. Louis in the summers, I was beyond exhausted by the time I got there, simply from the sleeplessness, the night tossing, and turning from pure excitement of what I got to do the next day. But I always did what every kid between the ages of 7 to 12 does. I had a blast at the park, and then was asleep as soon as I hopped into the back seat of the truck when we left not to wake up until we pulled into the driveway. Anyways, I was never scared of roller coasters, not even the ones with a loop. I was always the one leading whoever was with us down the long path of line you'd have to go through to get up to the ride. One by one, and coaster after coaster, I always knew that usually about halfway through our visit, I would be too chicken for a certain ride that still to this day I've never had the gall to get on. It's the damn train that takes you around the park. That's right, the freaking choo-choo train. Why? I cannot tell you for the life of me for a single reason, or even possibility as to why the hell I'm so terrified of trains. Now fast forward around a decade to the time when I'm 20 years old, I live in a small town in the southeast Missouri, and my mom lives in the house right next door. Every so often I would go next door and watch TV with her and my baby sister if I got bored. She also finally came to terms with the fact that I smoke weed, and when my sister is visiting my grandparents' house across town, I'll sometimes go share it with my mom. But this time in particular it was all three of us. I'm laying on the couch, my sister is at her princess table in the corner playing with something, and mom had just come from the kitchen with plates of taco salad she had whipped up for us. She sits down and I randomly had it on that show, I Used to Be Alive. If that's not the name of it, I apologize, but please correct me if you know the show I'm talking about. About 15 minutes into it, after she sits down, she says this. This reminds me of what you told me when you were about three years old. Thinking she was talking to my sister, I turned my head from the TV and she was looking at me. I said, huh? She then went on to tell me that when I was three years old, I randomly started talking about my other family. Apparently from what she told me, me, my two sisters, my mom, aunt, and our cat we're all headed somewhere and were killed after our train crashed. At first, I was like, ha ha ha, that's hilarious, thinking she was messing with me. But then she swore to God that I randomly said that when I was three years old. In that moment, something made sense that I've never in my life been able to find reasoning for. My fear of trains. Can someone help me with this? Could she be serious? I'll be 25 this year, and I still think about this pretty often, and it freaks me out. I used to live in southern Illinois with my grandma, aunt, and cousin. My aunt was a rebellious teenager and liked to explore abandoned houses. Since where we lived was mainly farmland, so yeah, there were a lot of those. One night, my aunt and her friends went into an abandoned house, 
and found a chest that had really old china in it. So they convinced my grandma to take them back to the house to retrieve the chest. Needless to say, they took my cousin and I. I had an uneasy feeling the entire way. When we got to the house, my aunt and her friend got out of the car and headed towards the house, while my grandma, myself, and my cousin waited in the car. I kept my eyes on the house. Up in the top middle window, out of nowhere, appeared a pair of bright red eyes. My cousin started crying and hid under the floorboard. I yelled and pointed it out to my grandma, and she yelled and called my aunt and her friends back. Nobody lived in that house, and the stairs to that floor didn't even exist anymore. I drove by that house earlier this year, and it's barely even standing anymore. All that's left is the chimney and barn surrounded by trees. This all happened when I was about five, and I will never forget it. When I was two years old, my uncle passed away from carbon monoxide poisoning while working for Stanley Steamer. I had no idea what death was, as I was a toddler. My parents never told me about it, and therefore I had no clue. The night that he died, my room filled up with daylight. My backyard was transformed into a big backyard with rolling hills and a red barn off in the distance. I lived in an apartment, and there was a golden ladder outside of my window shooting up as far as the eye could see. Then, my Uncle Chad appeared in less than an instant, on the ladder. He was in a white suit, with black shiny shoes, and he had this golden glow around him. Something was so serene about it. He told me everything was alright, and to tell my mom that everything was fine, and then proceeded to tell me to look at how beautiful it was. But at that point, I couldn't see anything but him. My mom said that she walked in the room because she heard me talking, and I was looking out the window into the night sky, just saying Jesus over and over again. I wasn't raised religious, had never been to church, and we still talk about it to this day, like all the time, just trying to make sense of it. This was a long time ago, when I was young and probably an 8th grader. My grandma was in the hospital for pneumonia, and everything seemed to be alright. She looked as if she was going to recover. Then, one night, on a school night, I was woken up at 11 with my sister saying that we need to go to our cousin's house. I was always seen as a mature kid and have taken care of my cousins and sister before, so when we showed up to my cousin's house, my parents said they needed to go to the hospital. My aunt and uncle packed up with my parents and left for the hospital. I was left in charge of my sister and my cousins. My two older cousins slept in the same room together, and their bed had a pull-out bed under it, so my sister crashed into that bed. My younger cousin was about two or so and still slept in a crib-type bed in another room. I decided to crash on the couch. Later that morning, I wake up and my aunt thanks me for watching the kids. She then tells me that my grandma passed away last night. This is where it gets weird. I slept right outside of the kitchen. My little baby cousin woke up with a sippy cup of hot chocolate. I didn't make that cup, and I doubt any of the other kids could make that cup without moving some furniture around to get to the microwave. And if they did, I would have surely heard it. My aunt then asked him who made it, and he tells us all that grandma made it for him last night. I believe that my grandma came to visit all of her grandchildren one last time before she left.
This happened a long time ago. I'm 26 now, and I was about 16 to 18 years old at the time. I just want to put my experience here so that I can remember it and be able to look back and read it when I'm way older. I lived in a remote area, off the side of Highway 69, here in northern Ontario. Wooded forest, swampy marshes here and there, winter time, but I forget the time and date. Me and my girlfriend at the time were at her place alone for the night. We hung out, watched movies, etc. We were going to sleep when we started to hear the dog outside whimpering. Now this little dog barks like a damn maniac at anyone or anything coming close to the driveway. The house was the last one on a long dirt road that leads further on to the Georgian Bay. Mind you, we are only like 600 meters from the highway, if that. Just some insight. Anyways, after a few moments of the dog whimpering, we hear something start to slowly come up the front stairs, the type of stairs that go up to the side of the house and directly to the door. These stairs passed by the living room window. It sounded like a bipedal thing slowly stepping up each step with a loud thud that seemed to slightly shake the porch or house or something. Like real aggressive coming up, but still slow and content. While this was happening, I'm asking my girlfriend if she knew who it could be. A drunk neighbor, maybe? She said that she didn't know. We were super freaked out at this time. We were already freaked at the dog whimpering. The amount of fear that I had was overwhelming. From the sound this thing made, it sounded large. The thing got to the front door, which was very close to her bedroom door, and made a huge bang or thud on the door. Not in a knocking manner, the knock kind of shakes the whole building. It did this about seven times, each about the same effort. We were freaking out, laying there while this was happening because you could just feel that it was bad. The thing walked back down the steps the same way it came up and we laid there forever waiting for something else, like a window tap or something. The whole time, we were freaking right out. We both got up and went to check the front living room window. The dog wasn't whimpering, but was still hiding in his doghouse at the bottom of the stairs. The light on the porch was on, and we saw no footprints. None in the driveway, none up the road towards the neighbors and highway. It creased me out thinking about that time. It just came up the stairs banged on the door really hard seven times, walked back down the steps, and left, I guess? The presence gave off bad vibes, and was creepy and overwhelming. I know it couldn't have been a person, and that's all I know. Does anyone know what it may have been? This one has three parts to it. I've debated splitting them into separate posts, but I feel like they kind of build off of each other. Granted, I have a lot of strange experiences, which I'm sure I'll share eventually, but these three flow together. Let me start at the beginning. My parents were older when they met. My mom was born in 1960 and my dad in 1956. They met at a New Year's Eve party in 1990, eventually marrying in 1992. They had a rough couple of years where my dad moved out, this happened twice, leaving my mom convinced that she would never have a family of her own. Eventually, they worked it out, and had my brother in late 1996. His birth wasn't smooth. He was born about three weeks late, and doctors had to rush in and perform an emergency C-section on him, as his heart rate spiked drastically. My mom said all these sirens went off, and about eight doctors rushed in. He was lucky to be alive, they said, and they said this again when he got extremely hurt as a three-year-old. There was a period of several days where my parents were counseled about possibly losing him, He's fine now, but he's the kid who shouldn't be alive. 
there was someone watching over him. He had cheated death twice, and Mom had dreams of angels holding him. Then, there was me. In December of 1997, when my mom was about 30 weeks pregnant with me, she awoke one night to severe cramps and profuse bleeding. My dad rushed her to the hospital, where a doctor told her, this doesn't look good, and another said, you'll likely lose the baby. She clutched my brother, praying for a miracle. Due to her age, doctors worried for me throughout the pregnancy. The next morning, I was fine. The bleeding stopped and everything returned to normal. They had no answers as to what went wrong. They were confused as to how I was alive. It prompted jokes that some higher power was guarding not only my brother, but me as well. I do have permanent effects from that day. When I was two, they discovered I had brain damage, which they linked to that day in 1997. Which brings me to the first strange experience, now that I've laid the foundation for you. When I was five, I got really sick. I'd missed over a week of school. I was constantly tired, throwing up, and lethargic. My mom took me to several doctors who could find zero issues with me, yet they knew I was sick. I didn't look well, and wasn't acting like myself. Give it a few weeks, she will get better, my doctor told my mom. She took me home and was reading me a goodnight story one night. In an effort to cheer me up, she read me my favorite story. Typically, I would giggle and get excited at certain points in the story, but not this night. I was unresponsive and so weak that moving even my head made me feel awful. Mom finally gave up reading to me. She looked at me and said, You really don't feel well? Would you like me to pray for you? I nodded. I was too young to understand religion, but I was aware enough to know that it meant something to her. I appreciated her help, although I was neutral to prayer. I can't remember the exact prayer, but she said something along the lines of, Please God, put your hand on her and heal her. She's felt sick for so long. After the prayer, she kissed me goodnight and left. I saw her enter her room and close the door behind her. I was alone. Not more than a minute later, I sat up. It was weird. Why did I sit up? It was as if someone controlled me. Also, I was so weak that the random energy to sit up got my attention. I looked around the room confused, but I saw no one. As I was pondering this, I felt this hand touch my shoulder. A gentle little pat. It had pressure and felt warm. Also, I could feel the individual fingers. I felt the hand on my back for only a second, and then it was gone again. Yet, here's the crazy part. The second the hand touched me, I felt instantly healed. I had energy, an appetite, and I didn't feel like puking. I was so excited that I wanted to dance around my room. I was facing my bedroom door when I felt the hand which touched me from behind. The hand didn't scare me. I never once felt fear. I looked all around my room, but of course no one was there, and I thought back to my mom's prayer. Was it God? I felt sure that it was. Once again, someone was watching over me, protecting me. It stayed with me, and I pondered it. I've never had anything happen like that since. Flash forward to two years later, I was in second grade. Every Friday, my granddad would pick my brother and I up from school. He would take us back to his house to spend the night. My brother and I would stay up late watching Cartoon Network, back when it was good, and order pizza. It was fantastic. Some of the best times of my childhood. One Friday stands out, though. The Friday that my brother and I almost died. The afternoon started off normal. My granddad picked us up from school, and we were headed to his house. My brother and I never wore seatbelts. We would pretend to click them in. This Friday, it slipped my granddad's mind to remind us to wear them, or maybe he figured a seven- and eight-year-old wouldn't need reminding. We were a mile from his home and pulled up at the four-way intersection. 
it was a red light, so we weren't moving. My brother and I were playing some game and were getting kind of rowdy in our play, and my granddad peered into his rear mirror and saw that we weren't wearing seatbelts. Please put your seatbelts on. You two know how dangerous it is to not wear them, he said. I kind of sighed and tried arguing with him. Never once in my seven years had I had something bad happen. Why would now be different? He held firm and I put the seatbelt on. I thought it was stupid. We'd be at the house in a few minutes, as we were about to enter his neighborhood. Not even 30 seconds after the seatbelt clicked into place, this giant white SUV plowed into us. It happened so fast that none of us saw it coming. Our car spun out into the intersection, and we spun maybe three times before stopping. It made me dizzy. His engine was smoking, and the smoke was so heavy that we couldn't see out of the car windows. It was dark. I couldn't even see my brother next to me. Are you alright? My granddad asked. We both answered yes. Hurry and get out of the car. The engine's probably on fire. The car could burst into flames, Granddad said. We scrambled out. I was in so much pain. The force of the car plowing into us caused me to fall forward, and the impact was so intense that the seatbelt cracked two of my ribs when it caught me. But better than death, right? For two months, my chest hurt. My granddad was covered in blood and required stitches. It was awful. He had to ride in the ambulance. I was so scared that I was uncontrollably crying. My brother and I had to ride home in a cop car. The police officer was extremely kind to me, and sat with me on the side of the road, cuddling me and reassuring me that everything was fine. That I was fine. That granddad was fine. She bought my brother and I ice cream for being brave and took us home. After the police were gone, and after my grandmother hammered my granddad for not making sure we wore seatbelts, he sat us down for a serious talk. He told us that this voice told him to check on us. The voice told him that something bad was about to happen, and that we weren't wearing seatbelts. He said it was so loud that he was shocked we didn't hear it. He said had the voice never talked to him, he would have never noticed that we weren't wearing them. As the paramedics were treating him, one of the police officers tried to make a joke about it. He said something like, Good thing the kids were wearing seatbelts. If they weren't, they would have died. It stayed with my granddad until he died. We would have died. The wreck was that severe and we were small. Even at seven, I was small for my age. I probably looked five or six. His car was totaled. He said the voice was clear as day, and he believed that our luck saved us again. Further proof that we had some supernatural power guarding us and protecting us. We shouldn't be alive right now, and I think about it a lot. That day in 2005. In 2018, the Saturday before Christmas, I was out on a birthday bar crawl in the Lower East Side. We were all getting a bit bored with the crowd and decided to go back to one of our friend's apartments to take a breather, listen to music, and decide what to move on to next. Cut to me realizing I had ten missed calls from various members of my family. My uncle had been rushed to the hospital and didn't make it. My uncle was the youngest of my mom's siblings and was more like an older teenage brother to me than an uncle. We grew up together in a very close family. I don't think I realized how quickly grief hits when you get news like that. The sound of my father's voice cracking and straining to get the words, he didn't make it, out of his mouth, was more than I could handle. I crumbled into a pile of tears right in the middle of the kitchen. In a daze, I made my way back up to Harlem, trying to pull myself together and figure out what to do. I couldn't get anyone in the city on the phone. 
I couldn't get myself to call anyone in the family, so I needed to suck it up and get home that night. Mission accomplished. Flight changed, bags packed with the help of my neighbor, and a couple clonopin to get me the hell home. All of this to get to the point of this story. I'm barely able to keep myself together as I wait on the subway platform. The change of ticket and my lack of savings just wouldn't allow for a taxi ride to the airport. Just as I feel like I'm about to completely break down again, I notice a man in a lightly colored, absolutely beautiful suit. He had blonde bobbing curls on top and shortly buzzed on the side. I turned to take a bit more notice and then saw his face. It's strange to say, but I can't recall anything about it now. It's a blank space in a very detailed memory. The only thing I can remember about his appearance was that it absolutely took my breath away. It wasn't in an OMG this man is so sexy kind of way, it was sheer admiration for the absolutely perfect and symmetrical face. So here we are, the only two people waiting at the stop on 145th. The man seems to be almost giddy with joy as if he was seeing the world for the very first time. Not a crazed, forced happiness. He seemed as genuine as a child in Disney World seeing the Magic Kingdom for the first time. When we boarded the subway, he sat mirrored to me. I was in a far left seat, and he was on the opposite side of the train to the right. It was quite crowded, but I looked up at some point before the 125th stop, to see that he was staring directly at me. It wasn't scary. It was as if he was waiting for me to finally notice him. All he did was look me in the eyes, nod his head in confirmation, and wink at me. It gives me chills to remember it. The comfort that washed over me felt like a warm embrace. I felt the security of a child who had scraped their knee. That feeling of mom making it all better? I was able to get myself home, head held high, and without the help of the clonopin. I'm not a religious person. I have scuffed about God, and I felt resentful when anyone brings up their beliefs. I don't know how to explain it, but I have this deep feeling that I saw an angel that day, all alone and navigating through intense emotions. I truly feel this man was sent to give me the comfort and strength to get home. It almost feels embarrassing to type that out, but I have no other explanation. A close friend of my mother's used to live in a fairly large split-level home with an odd layout. After opening the front door to this abode, one would be confronted with the long set of steps that led to the second floor. The most essential parts of the house were on the second floor, but there were a couple of bedrooms on the ground floor. I had always found this place to be subtly off-putting and quite uncanny. Every time I visited it, I found its residual energy hard to shake off, so to speak. The feeling that it left me with would often bleed into the next couple of days. No matter where I was, my surroundings still felt like the house for a little while before the effect wore off. I experience this sort of thing with most places I visit, but the aura of this house was particularly strong. When I was about five, my mother and I visited the home. After we were all settled in and Mom was having an involved and lively conversation with her friend in the kitchen, I had the sudden urge to explore every inch of this strangely configured house. The kitchen and living room were at the top of the initial set of stairs, and everything else was to my right. I followed a long corridor with several dens and bedrooms on either side of it. There was a large bedroom and a narrow set of stairs that led to the ground level. On the first level, there was a lot of cheap faux wood paneling, two small rooms, and another smaller bathroom. I remained in and around the corridor on the second floor for a while, and found seemingly endless things to explore. 
The house didn't even look that big from the outside, and I was baffled at the discrepancy between its interior and exterior. I wandered into one of the dens, which was the last room on my left. It had a lot of beautiful natural light and a fully mirrored wall, which might have been a closet with a sliding mirrored door. Next to the mirror, there was something hanging on a narrow wall that caught my attention. It was a stark white mask. It could have been painted wood, but it also might have been ceramic. Its face was round and had very chubby cheeks. Its tiny mouth was closed and had cherry red lips that smiled slightly. Its eyes were also very tiny and almond shaped, and I interpreted the features to be male. This mask seemed notably out of place. The house was unusual, but its decor was typical of suburbia in the mid-1980s. It also had a nautical vibe because the husband of Mom's friend was a sailor. The mask looked like it was teleported straight out of the 15th century China. A more appropriate setting for the artifact would have been a museum, or at least a fancier house. I stood there and stared at it for a while and gradually became a little lightheaded. I felt inexplicably drawn to its smooth, plump, white face and Mona Lisa smile. At some point, Mom and her friend found me in the mirrored room. One of them asked me what I was doing in there all by myself, took my hand, and led me into the kitchen for a late lunch. In the following years, throughout my childhood, I would sometimes think of the mask and fall into a brief trance-like state whenever it entered my mind. Sometimes I would dream of it. Nothing would really happen in these dreams, I would just be standing there and my surroundings would change. Often I would find myself in my parents' bedroom, or wandering the split-level house. The aura of the mask would be present and I would feel slightly lightheaded as before. Whenever I dreamed of the mask, the feeling of the house and of the mask would be impossible to get rid of the following day or two. Sometimes I found it unsettling as well as mesmerizing, but never figured out why. I can't remember how old I was, but between the ages of 7 and 10 approximately, I would ask my mom if she remembered seeing a mask at the split-level home. I would describe it in detail and mom would always look puzzled, suggest that I may have seen it at someone else's house, and assume that my memory was faulty. I asked her about it several times periodically throughout my preteen years, and each time, she would have no recollection of me asking about it previously. Without fail, she would suggest that I saw it somewhere else, and that my little five-year-old memory was unreliable. One day I was frustrated and asked my mom to ask her friend if she ever had a white Asian mask with a chubby face and small red lips in her suburban home in the 80s. The answer was no. No one remembered this mask. I've known my house was haunted my entire life. My family knows as well. My mom always told me they can't hurt you. The entities have always targeted me as I'm an only child. I've seen and heard things that I can't explain all my life. They seemed to enjoy my fear and feed off of it. They used the stairs to torment me the most. For years, I heard what sounded like someone walking up and down the stairs. I know it wasn't apparent because I used to open my door when I was almost positive it was my dad, and no one was ever there. Also, it wouldn't happen continuously for a few minutes or up to an hour straight. Up and down, up and down. It was different some nights. Sometimes it would be like someone was running up and down the stairs. Sometimes it would be really slow and I could hear each and every step. I would always feel like it was coming to get me. It always happened around 12 to 3 a.m. One time it was so loud that I started crying out of sheer terror. I was too scared to leave my room and run to my parents. I just sat in bed, shaking absolutely terrified. My parents said they didn't hear it the next day. 
I still don't understand how it didn't wake them up. It was as if someone was wearing heavy boots stomping up each step. The first floor at night was another story. That's where everything happened. As a kid, I used to sprint down, grab what I needed as fast as possible, and then run back up to my room. It was terrifying. I always felt as if someone was standing right behind me, watching every move I made. I would get chills, and my heart would race. I tried to never show my fear because I knew whatever it was enjoyed it when I was afraid. My friends were also terrified of the house as well. Going down for any reason was always a joint effort. They would never go downstairs alone. One of the worst experiences that has happened occurred one random night when I went down to get a snack. I was in front of the fridge, and all of a sudden I had a horrible feeling that came about. It literally felt like someone was breathing down my neck. I felt pure hatred, like it really wished that it could hurt me. I still remember the feeling. I sunk in fear and realized I had to run. I ran as fast as I could back to my room and closed the door. Not even a minute later, I heard it running up the stairs after me. I didn't sleep that night, though. I still get chills thinking about it. As I got older, I got used to its games and I stopped feeding into them. I started to sleep with the TV on pretty loud so that I didn't hear the stairs. I've learned that I needed to completely ignore their attempts to stir me. If I got afraid, I would repeat over and over in my head for it to go away. I haven't experienced anything in years because of this. I guess they got bored from not getting terrified reaction out of me anymore, since I'm no longer a kid. But I'm just glad that it stopped, honestly. So this isn't something I've had hands-on experience with, save for the weird noises and misplaced objects, but stories passed down from my grandparents, on my dad's side. My dad's family has been living here in this village for almost 50 years. My country is really small, I live in the Trinidad, which is an island in the Caribbean, and as people we hold high belief in the paranormal. So, it's not uncommon to have your brothers and sisters living on the same street. Our house is located on the corner of an intersection. Keep in mind that this is a village, so there's a back road, and the intersecting road isn't even a road. It's a dusty trail, and there's not much development aside from the actual houses, so the rest of the area is deep foliage. So, the story involves my home, the three neighbors across from us, two right next to each other are brothers, and then there's the house next to ours across the trail, and the house opposite that, and the house behind that one. So it kind of forms a disfigured circle. Long before I was born, and my dad and his sisters were really young, the old lady's husband from across the street got sick and died. Now, this is a Hindu family that partook in blood sacrifices and Kalipuja, so it was assumed they did black magic to acquire their wealth. So when he died, his spirit couldn't leave the earth. My grandmother said every night after his passing she could hear stuff like dishes and bricks being thrown around and destroyed, but when she went over to see what was wrong, the kitchen was spotless. It was after this occurred a couple of times they figured out that it was his restless spirit, and they decided to hold the funeral earlier than planned to lay him to rest. On the night of his funeral, his wife almost died as well, because as she leaned over his coffin, something began choking her and pulling her down into it. They got her out, of course, but then his spirit, or whatever it was, began moving things around. The potted plants rearranged themselves, the chairs stacked together, the doors of the house blew open. Now, personally, I would have left and let them deal with that, but 
because our people are so superstitious, it didn't really affect any of them. So they stayed and continued on with the proceedings. Later, my grandma would tell me that she had experienced much more paranormal things in her life, so that didn't even faze her. After the funeral, things died down, until my grandfather's sister-in-law who lived in the house across from us, which is now occupied by the son of the restless spirit, started seeing spirits, specifically a tall, naked man of African descent. She saw him multiple times, but she was always alone at night when it happened. He would stand in the doorway to her bedroom and just stare at her, and sometimes she said there'd be a white coffin floating at the foot of her bed, and he would be lying inside of it. She passed away soon after, without ever resolving the cause of her hallucinations. But I've heard mumblings among the Indian women of our family that it was a symbol, a warning that her husband was having an affair, but she died without finding out the truth. Then there's the story of the mango tree in the lot to our left. The people who lived there at the time were simply tenants renting from an old woman who allegedly killed her husband in the house, and then hid his body in an old metal bunker in the backyard. She had a lot of animals in her yard, pigs, chickens, ducks, etc., and so the stench of it all would cover the stench of her rotting spouse. When anybody asked her about him, she said that they had gotten a divorce and that he went back to England. He was a white man and she was East Indian. Nobody questioned it, because all people would do back in that time was simply gossip about the causes and move on when they got bored. Rumor has it that his body completely decayed in that bunker, and that he continues to haunt the home And since a new family moved into the house, and customary to Caribbean folk blessed the house before moving in, he couldn't stay in there, and instead occupied the mango tree in the backyard. I was around six at this time, and my dad and I would go and look up at the tree, because there was a large shadowy circle in the middle of it that, no matter how much light shone through the leaves, we couldn't see anything. Now the tree is gone, of course, but it still feels like something lives there, because of the ever-present shadow that hovers over that house. Now, for my house, and the house behind the one across the street. My grandfather's brother lived there. My grandparents always saw apparitions. We have a legend here in the Caribbean about a woman with the foot of a cow called La Diablesse, Devil Woman. She's said to be the most beautiful woman ever and would lure men by stopping them as they drove by to ask for a ride, and she would always sit in the back seat. When the men arrived at whatever destination she requested, they would look in the mirror to find that she was gone. Then she would haunt them by appearing in her true form and tormenting them constantly until they took their own lives, or she caused their death in some sort of accident. My grandparents would see this woman roaming the street with her chain dragging behind her as she seeked out her next victim, and sometimes she would stare right back at them in the dark of the night. They would also hear horses running through the trail next to our house, hooves pounding relentlessly, but as soon as they stepped outside to see, they would vanish. There would also be a spirit that would choke my grandfather in his sleep. He would be thrashing and crying in his sleep, and my grandmother would have to shake him until he woke up. All of these things have been happening gradually over the past 40 years. Everyone who marries into the family has also been able to see and hear these paranormal things. I've never had any serious encounters with the paranormal, apart from seeing people in shadows where there are none, and hearing noises that should not be heard. It's never scared me at all, maybe because I grew up hearing the stories and surrounded by myths and folklore all of my life, so it all seems normal. But one thing I can guarantee is that something plagues the village that I live in. It was here 40 years ago, and it's still here now.
I'm not sure if this is the right place to post this, and it's definitely not as out of pocket as most of the posts on here, but I've always thought it was interesting. When we were younger, my sister used to faint pretty frequently. The first time it ever happened, she had gotten up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and collapsed in front of the sink. Luckily, there was a brand new family pack of toilet paper rolls in the corner that cushioned her fall so she wasn't hurt. But this also meant that it didn't make a loud enough sound to wake anyone up in the middle of the night. Regardless of this, my mom somehow woke up and found my sister while she was still unconscious on the bathroom floor. When my sister faints, she's only completely unconscious for a few seconds before coming to again, which means that my mom would have had to have woken up as soon as the fall happened. It's unlikely that any noise woke her up, because the toilet paper muffled it, and my sister was pretty young and small, so she wouldn't have made a very loud crash anyways. My room was closest to the bathroom, and I didn't hear a thing. Also, my parents had their own bathroom in their room, so even if my mom had woken up at the perfect moment by chance, there's no reason she would have needed to go outside to the kids' bathroom. My mom describes it as mother's instinct, and claims that she suddenly woke up for no reason, and just had a feeling that one of her kids was in trouble. She went to check on us and saw the bathroom light on, and that's when she found my sister. I'm sure there are a million other explanations for this, and maybe my mom did hear some kind of thump and just didn't register it in her sleepy mind, but I think it's interesting and kind of sweet to believe the mother's instinct version. I have experienced different paranormal things and events throughout my life, and have always been an on-the-fence believer. Working in theaters for so many years, I'd often heard things, seen a few things here and there, but nothing got under my skin as much as the subliminal haunting I experienced. I had just moved with my parents into an older house in a new state and town. The previous owners had left a lot of things behind mainly storage bins in the attic and a few decorations, and I would always find the most interesting things in my room. I was in my second year of undergrad, and was staying home for the summer, and I started having these dreams. In these dreams, I was always very sick and dying, or someone I loved was dying and they needed a bone marrow transplant to live. I dreamt about this every night until I left to go back to school. Then, I was obsessing over it. All I could think about was donating bone marrow, to the point that when I heard a Be The Match rep was coming to my campus, I signed up to donate with them without even thinking twice. As soon as I signed up, the dreams and obsessions stopped. It was like I was finally calm and all of this deep-rooted anxiety left me. I texted my mom that I had made a big decision, and wanted to call and talk to her, and she called me almost immediately. The weirdest thing happened to me today, she said. I told her that I had had a weird day too, but she continued. There was a 5k that went through our neighborhood today. I asked around to figure out what it was for, and it turns out, it's a race to raise money for this bone marrow transplant charity in honor of the woman who used to live in our house. She died waiting on a transplant. Isn't that weird? And we didn't even know it. Sometimes seeing things or hearing things isn't as scary as feeling things deep inside, like the need to help when someone is in need, even if that someone isn't alive anymore. A call for help from beyond the grave. I stayed on that list for a full three years and planned to continue being available as a donor. And I urge you all to look up bethematch.org and consider making the commitment, too. As a child, I was always watching scary things because I enjoyed the rush of it. However, it never crossed my mind that it could have been a bad idea. 
One night, when I think I was in second or third grade, I was asleep and was facing the wall, my back to the door. The door, however, was open, because light needed to be in the room, because at this time I was afraid of the dark. I remember rolling over to look at the other side of the room. I looked at the door to see someone, or something, standing there. It looked masculine from how the frame was. It was completely black and taller than the door frame, but it wasn't standing directly in my room. It was outside of it, looking at me, and drawing me in. There was no way that that could have been a shadow. Shadows aren't completely black. As a child, I thought it was completely normal that it was there and thought nothing of it, so I rolled back over and fell asleep. Now, though, I would probably be scared and feel drawn to it. I still remember that I wish I would have talked to it or something of the sort. This happened yesterday. I was at a friend's house, and there were five of us, including me. The friend has a pretty cool house, but it is very unsettling. Her room has a little room inside of it. Like, it doesn't have a door, it's just a room for clothes and miscellaneous items. That room has a big mirror that is turned to her bed. Her little sister used to talk about her friend, Dina, and it was pretty creepy, but I brushed it off usually because I don't believe in ghosts, imaginary friends, and things of that sort. So, anyway, we were chilling in her room, talking, just celebrating, and suddenly most of us got the chills and it absolutely destroyed our vibe. We got scared and crawled onto her bed and just stayed there. It was around 4 o'clock in the morning. We laid there, spooked. I myself got chills, but... After some time, I calmed down and just laid on the floor and was watching YouTube. Then the iMac in her room turned on once. The loud noise startled me and I crawled onto the bed with them. The iMac then turned off, and in like five seconds it turned on again and then once again turned off. At this point, I was in complete shock, and my adrenaline was so strong, it felt like I was choking myself. The owner that lived there got a panic attack and started crying. Me and another guy decided to cover the mirror in the small room with the blanket, because it was very uncomfortable to look at. While we were walking over there, like five meters from the bed, we instantly got cold and turned around. I had no control of my movement when I turned around. It felt like my brain just told me not to go there. Well, anyway, we sat in the bed terrified. The girls were crying, and I was stunned and didn't know how to react. At 8 o'clock, it started to get brighter, and we felt much safer. It was a scary experience, and I kind of want to go back there again. I don't believe in ghosts, like, 100%, but it definitely made me think when I got home and laid in bed. So that, my friends, was a collection of some interesting and chilling paranormal stories remade. As mentioned at the beginning of this video, these are all from very, very early 2020, or very, very late 2019, which is literally... Mm, stretching, sorry. Literally whenever I started my channel. Um, first video went up, I believe, 12-9, December 9th, 2019 because I created the channel December 4th, 2019, so, yeah. Good stories, good old stories. I, have, I know back then, whenever I did them, I didn't do them very well, because I still had no idea what the hell I was doing, so. Uh, it's nice to come back to these and do them a second time, give them a second Passover, fresh coat of paranormal paint, if you will. And I know a lot, I know a lot of you, not really a lot of you, some of you, I know some of you have said, hey, you should consider redoing some of them, so here you go. Here's the sixth time I've remade stories. Fifth or sixth. I'm gonna be honest, I don't know which one it is, so. Hopefully you all enjoyed the stories. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button. 
If you're new to the channel and liked what you heard, consider subscribing as it helps a lot. And if you want more stories like this, just leave me a comment down below saying, hey, I want more paranormal stories. You know I'll do them. I do paranormal stories at least once a month. Cuticle looks really messed up on my finger. Anyways, um, I do them typically once a month, sometimes twice a month, sometimes more a month. We'll see. Not really more a month, though, unless I have like a month where I just go ham on paranormal stuff. Might do that someday. I don't know. Uh, yeah. You can also join Patreon memberships to get early access to content like this and other content, depending on how you're feeling or what you sign up for. I guess not really how you're feeling. Your feelings won't affect what level of membership or partner pa Patreon thing you sign up for. Or maybe it will. Anyways, friends, hope you're all having a beautiful week, and hope I see you again here very soon. But until then, remember you are loved, you are valid, you are important. You are the best you that you can be. Do not forget it. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And until I see you again, much love, and of course, sleep well.